I'm going to talk to you really quick before we dig in about the counterpart to the band pass stuff that we did in chapter uh, 29, which is lecture 27. Okay, so the counterpart to it that I want to address here is we talked about band pass filters in, in lecture 27, um, but we didn't really talk about <clears throat> all the different flavors we get for low pass filters in that section. So what I want to do right now really quick is examine uh, some of those low pass filter characteristics that we might not have readily identified before. So here we go. Notice here this is a, a low pass filter that we've tried to create, but it's uh, under damped. And so you can see that in the under damped case we actually get this asymptote before we had the asymptote come down this way, right? It kind of also went down to zero. And so this was sort of okay in, in a sense because it was isolating that frequency and only giving us back that frequency. However, comma, the, the big issue here is that for a low pass filter, it's now ramping up frequencies right in here and then quickly dropping off again. So if you get, you know, your signal is somewhere in here, you can get some pretty wild fluctuations for your amplitude that's in there. Okay, so what we want to do, uh, critically damped, or rather the, um, right where it's on the uh, double pole on that um, resonance frequency, right? And so we get a nice clean behavior from that. So you can see here that this just kind of overlaps, and it um, overlaps until it gets to about here. And then over here, uh, it drops back off. Um, so... The nice thing about this is it's holding uh, that behavior for us. Okay, let's see what happens now if I if I spread these apart by a factor of 10. Aha, now you can see that it's pulling these two poles away. And so our transition band is kind of lazy, okay? It's become lazy because right at the critical point that we wanted before at 10 at that resonance frequency, it's now spread it over these two so that I have some attenuation at a rate of negative 20 dB between here and here, and then negative 40 from there on out. So I really have like two transition bands. That is not ideal. What I really want from my pass band characteristic is so is I want it to pass all this stuff nicely and then just drop the hell off. Like, don't mess around, don't jump up here and give me some extra frequency in that region. Don't give me, you know, low and slow. You know, eventually I'll get there. I don't want that either. I want it to drop off quickly as possible without this bumpy behavior. Okay guys, I gotta go over some super important stuff that I missed from the upload for chapter 27. It's already up and loaded, so I'm just gonna push it into this next chapter, and uh, that way you have it in time for the quiz coming up at the end of the week. I wanna note that this is super important because you'll probably get questions related to something like this, and I think that this uh, little tidbit that I'm gonna stick at the beginning here is really gonna help clarify what we're talking about when we look at different kinds of filters, be it band pass, low pass, or high pass filters, and help um, cage our gyros for the, uh, the Butterworth filters that we're going to encounter here shortly. So, uh, fun fact, cage your gyros. I love this term. Okay. And not just cause I was in the air force, but because it's, it's really a fun term. So cage your gyros basically just means like getting a good fix on your position and how you're rotating through space. So you're not tumbling out of control before you, uh, continue going on your mission. Um, we actually had to do this for certain systems because the B-52 would actually pass off its, um, you know, all of its telemetry readings to the missile. And so you'd drop a missile off this thing and well, what do you know? The missile's got uh, bad gyros going out. So, um, you know, if you didn't do that ahead of time, it, it could spiral the missile out of control or it wouldn't perform as well. Um, so yeah, this is a cage your gyros moment. Okay. And it's a very important one. And I want you guys to get a good fix on this material right here. Okay. So that's why I'm emphasizing it right here, right now. So do not skip this part and please take good notes on it. Okay. So that being said, let's dig in. So I'm going to look at, I want to compare it to the different outputs that we could have done. So this is a bandpass filter on the left here. We're going to do the low pass in the middle. 
and the high pass filter on the right. And we can actually pull all three of these from the behavior output behaviors of the circuit by looking at three different voltage outputs here, here, and here. Okay. Now, for the bandpass filter, we've already kind of analyzed this. So I'm just going to glaze over it real quick. So VR over VN gives us, and I don't want to say equals here, right? Um, Tom, you know, Tom would sometimes do this in his lectures, which is a little evil, I think, because the lowercase v really represents the time domain, right? So to be technically correct, we're just going to call this HS because this is a transfer function when we transform it into the signal domain. And we must realize that we're in the signal domain. So realistically, this is equal to capital VR over capital VN, okay? And that's true for the rest of the things that I'm going to show you here today. But suffice it to say, we can we can think about it in these in this way. Um, so uh, R times 1 over L S is what we had over uh, S squared plus R over L S plus 1 over L C. Notice here that we have, uh, we're going to have the same two poles, same two poles throughout, okay, throughout this, this whole section here. And then notice here we have 1, 0, okay? So if you have 1, 0 coming out of the gate, and that 1, 0 is at 0, by the way, um, and recall, just to refresh your memory, a zero is just any kind of root that you have in the uh, numerator, right? Any kind of root that you have sitting up here, okay? And our root happens to be at zero. So this is going to tailor itself all the way back. And this is going to create a nice bandpass filter for us. Let me do it in a different color so you guys have some, some happy times here. So this is going up at 20 dB. And then we have two poles, so it's smack, smack, right at the same time, minus 20 dB, Going back down the other side, we call this the cutoff frequency, or you could call it the uh, resonance frequency in most cases here. So that's that's just fine by us. Um, you may also get some funky behaviors that we're going to talk about here in a moment. Um, this would be for a uh, um, underdamped, right? We talked about that. And if it's completely undamped, right, you get an asymptote right there. And if it's overdamped, you get this, right? Two poles get separated if it's over damped. So this spreads it out a little bit, right? And actually, let me go ahead and do that other one in a separate color so it's easier for you guys to see. Unless you're colorblind, and, and no one said that they're colorblind yet. So, uh, okay, so um, anyway, this is the overdamped. And then the green here actually would be closer to our uh, critical damped. Okay. Now, when I get to the low-pass filter, what do I expect? Well, the low-pass filter, um, we can actually generate this from VC over VN, okay? And this is equal to 1 over uh, SC, and that's times, uh, whoops. So then we have uh, the same poles in the denominator, 1 over LC. Okay, the S's cancel here, so we have uh, no zeros, right? If you want an E in there, I don't really care. Um, two poles. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's the same two poles, right? Okay, so how does this work? Well, we have a start off here, and then it's going to, at that critical critical frequency, it's going to fall down. Um, and there we are. Now, if we have uh, some under damping going on, we end up with this sort of behavior. And you can actually identify uh, these points a little bit for yourself if you want to. Um, realistically, it's going to come down to uh, looking at that pole zero plot and coming up with the uh, inflection points of that curve and looking at the peak here at this particular uh, frequency that gives you the best output result. Now, we also noted that when we did our band pass, when we came up to this, if we had a completely undamped system, this becomes completely asymptotic. Um, and even if you do this in like MATLAB or something like that, right? These are just discrete points. So you, you may be a little off kilter here if you try to grab that point just willy nilly. So it's it's best to try to solve through uh, the equation for that, for the magnitude. And make sure you use the magnitude, not just the transfer function itself. And I messed up here. This should have a little arrow, right? Because that's technically not correct. Okay, so this would be again, under damped. And so just by taking the, the voltage output from a different location, we've been able to realistically uh, look at this as a, um, as a low-pass filter or create a low-pass filter just by taking the output from somewhere else. Okay, so a couple things to note here. So this is a minus 40 dB drop, right? Because we have two poles at this critical point. If we go to an 
underdamped or I'm sorry, excuse me an overdamped scenario where our poles start to spread apart right our poles are spreading apart from there what we have is two 20 decibel drops okay so 20 db and then another 20 db all right the high pass filter should come as no surprise we're going to be looking at it over the inductor okay and that's just going to give us um, you can derive the equation for that, but um, that's going to give us the high pass filter. Okay. Um, it's not critical that you, well, you should be able to derive this equation by now. So I leave this as a, as a homework exercise. Okay. Okay. So a little mini homework, derive the, uh, the transfer function for that. Sure. Why not? Easy. Um, and then what I want you to realize for it though, is when you, when you find it, you know, post it on Piazza. I'll give a cookie to the first person that finds it. <laughs> it's going to create a, uh, a high pass filter, right? Very similar. And the kind of characteristics we expect to see here uh, are very similar to our other system, right? This is the under damped critical. And this is uh, this here is our over damped. Okay, and then it's minus, or uh, plus 20 dB. And then plus 20 dB. Actually, it goes from, this should be over here, guys, sorry. This should be minus 40. Uh, this is minus 20, com or minus uh, 40 coming up. Sorry about that. And then minus 20 from there on up. And then finally up here somewhere at the next pole, it goes to zero. Okay, and then the underdamped again has that little blip in it. Um, so where is this? Where is this all kind of coming from? Um, or what's a good uh, reference point for us? Well, um, let's see. When we have a system, right? When we have a a, a more complex system, we have some kind of input circuit, right? And then we can pass it off to this thing, and depending on where we take our output from. Okay, we may be able to create, right, if this is, say, VR, VL, or VC, we may be able to create, um, you know, based on these various options, a band pass, a low pass, or a high pass filter. Okay, so this is some kind of filter, but it has a variety of different ways that you can access it and utilize it. And then uh, from here, what we do is, you know, you take your, your output circuit from there, right? So maybe you wanted to pick up some kind of signal or something or s some kind of speech or whatever, and you want to filter out, say, all the high frequencies or something, stuff that you can't even hear, uh, get a nice clean signal. Um, then you pass it off after you filtered it to the next stage. Maybe you want to amplify it after that, okay? So this circuit really helps us filter out some of the uh, frequency behaviors that we just don't like. And depending on the situation that we're in, we may want to use one or multiple stages of these kind of filters um, to be able to get exactly what we need back out. And what we're going to see is that really bandpass filters are kind of a hybrid, really, um, between a low pass filter on top of a high, pa uh, a high pass filter. And that kind of makes sense intuitively, right? Because at the end of the day, what we're really doing with a low pass and high pass filter is filtering between whatever this was and whatever this was, right? If we, if we put them where this is a little bit higher than this guy, then we end up by compiling the, them together with a bandpass filter, okay? So that should make some sense. All right, let's look at an, a nicer picture of this. So this is going to be a low pass filter for us. And what I've done here is I've generated this using the pole zero plotter. And uh, with the pole zero plotter, what I did was I said, okay, I'm going to create two complex ones. And the best way to demonstrate this is there's something that has a large imaginary component. Okay, so something like uh, 1 plus minus 100J will really do it for you. You'll be able to see this blip really nicely. Um, and then this is our critically damped. And then this would be overdamped, right? And you can see that right away because you have a, a spot here and a spot here. I can tell you exactly where these two uh, poles were at. They were at um, 10 to the 0, which is equals 1, and 10 squared, which is 100, okay? So my takeaway from this, and this is another big 
star slide, okay, that you should be able to be familiar with, is you should be able to look at this and tell me exactly what each one of these things is, what they're doing, what kind of filter it is, and where all the pulls, zeros, and resonances are for this circuit. I don't even care what the circuit looks like. You know what, um, you know what it is. And as a matter of fact, you could also know what the circuit looks like. <laughs> if I tell you how fast this is dropping off, you could definitely, and actually you, you don't even know, need that either because you know that you have two poles here and that this rate matches uh, this rate here for the second drop off of the yellow. You know this is a second order system right away. I can almost guarantee you there will be a question on this when we get to filters for quizzes, okay? Hello again everybody and welcome back to ECE 2002. Uh, my name is Art Turlop, and uh, I'll be your guide on this wonderful adventure for the next couple of chapters here. So, um, what are we going to run into? Well, we only have 10 lectures left, okay? Including this one, by the way. Um, and we're starting to get into the realm of alphabet soup, where we have, you know, just all these <laughs> letters that go together. Um of course, you know what all these are by now, right? This is a field effect transistor, and this is a bandpass filter. This is a low frequency responses is what we're going to be doing today. But what's happening from here forward is we're going to be taking a closer look at that hardware uh, and the assumptions that we made right at the beginning of the course. And we're going to be saying, okay, now that we've developed these tools for how to see things in the frequency domain, how can we actually apply them? What are they useful for? And... This chapter and chapter 31 um, start to dig into the MOSFET side of things. So we've already dealt with, you know, our common uh, uh, elements of a circuit, our R, L, and C, and seeing what they do in the, in the frequency domain. Now what happens to those MOSFETs that we started off with, and, uh, and uh, effectively our op amps too, right, at the end of the day. So what can we do with these that, um, you know, that, that we now have the tools to work with. Um, so, the buck stops here. We're finally going to discuss uh, the mid-frequency model for our amplifiers, okay? Before we just kind of made the assumption that, eh, they work there somewhere uh, in this nebulous region. Now we're actually going to define how they work and where they work and why. Um, we're also going to start incorporating capacitors into our small signal model for MOSFETs. So that will be and I use quotes here, quite fun, okay? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a pain in the butt. I'm not going to lie. This stuff gets confusing, so you're going to need to review it. You're going to need to do the homework. You're going to need to read the book. You might even need to rewatch this lecture a time or two uh, to really get it. But we'll, we'll push through, and we only got 10 left, so just stick with it, and you can do it, all right? You've been doing a great job so far. All right. Enough pep talk. Let's get into it. So... Amplifier circuits can be approximated by this diagram. This diagram should look very familiar to you. Um, recognize here that this is the intrinsic voltage gain, which is effectively how we see our magnitude in the frequency domain for our MOSFETs, okay? Um, we have this regular old uh, climb right here that we're, we all know and love, this linear scale, and then a descending linear scale on the other side. Um, and then in the middle, it's pretty well flat but right here and right here these are where we've dropped by about uh three decibels okay we've talked about that a little bit um if you don't understand why that is the halfway marker um i encourage you to go look up the 3 db drop online somewhere from one of your previous uh books i think you guys covered that with uh when you talked about like phaser stuff or in 20,001 hopefully um, if not, you know, hit me up on the Piazza and, and we'll get you all sorted out, I guess. But try to look it up on your own a little bit too. Okay, so we are in the dB scale, the decibel scale here, right? And uh, effectively what we have is unscaled, right? This doesn't look like half, but in reality it is. We have this mid-range frequency as defined as half of whatever this maximum is. To be even more specific, we could write... Um, you know, this is equal to 20 log 10 of whatever that uh, uh, amplification is, or gain, uh, divided by the reference. And in this case, our reference is, is just going to be that max. So, 
there we are. That's uh, that's pretty much it. We're living in, and breathing now in the frequency domain. So, for our high frequency behavior for a MOSFET, guess what? We lied to you. Again. That's pretty much the theme of this course is... Um, sorry, not sorry, but I, I lied. <laughs> um, I don't know. Or you could, you know, if I had to pick a meme, maybe it's that, that pirate guy. So effectively everything is, well, yes, but actually no. <laughs> right? I mean, so we, we, before we said, Hey, these, these don't touch each other at all. Don't worry about it. No, no current or anything passes through here. Well, Yes, but actually, no, there is a little bit at, at high frequencies, okay? So we have a little bit of leakage. Um, so in this case, when we get to the pico, or I'm sorry, when we get to the uh, gigahertz range, um, we start to see that it's no longer an open circuit. Uh, by the way, uh, for example, the book says, you know, 5 gigahertz is uh, equal to, or equivalent to roughly uh, 3.14 uh, times 10 to the 10th, you know, radians per second. All right. So pretty, pretty high frequency, but, um, you know, we do a lot of stuff in, in these regions nowadays, uh, for, for signals processing. So the, the hardware limitations are profoundly important for understanding what kind of stuff is coming through and what kind of effects are happening to the hardware that's being used. If you don't understand the hardware, you're not going to understand uh, the signal itself, or st artifacts in the signal itself, too. So. so here we no longer have this open circuit assumption, and as we go forward a little bit further, we're going to start incorporating this, but we need to lay down some groundwork first, because we really haven't talked about um, too much what uh, external capacitors even do to, right, we, we need to talk about what external capacitors do in our a small signal model first, and then we can incorporate these guys as well. Because in all of our models, we have all these ex external capacitors that were quote-unquote friendly for us before, but now, now that we're in the frequency domain, they might not be so friendly. So we need to make sure that they are. And if they're not in, in certain frequency ranges, then we need to figure out what their behavior actually is. Um, so we need to uh, anal we need analysis tools for capacitors in series and capacitors in parallel with the primary current source flow. All right. Does it make sense? Clear as mud? All right. Yeah, we're getting to all the muddy stuff now. So that's, you know, I'm going to keep saying that because number one, I don't know. I'll be honest. I've picked up a couple idiomatic phrases from the military and that's one of my favorite ones. So there you are. <laughs> Some of them I can't repeat here. <laughs> Suffice it to say. Okay, so uh, here we go. Let's do the uh, let's do this guy over here first. So this is a capacitor in series with two other resistors. We're looking at the voltage drop ac across this resistor, and it should be pretty clear to you what's going to happen in in both of these cases actually. So I want you to stop for a minute in this video, and I want you to ask yourself. What happens in these two cases as the frequency goes from low or close to zero to high uh, for, for these different models or these different systems? So you paused it, got it figured out. Great. All right, let's talk about what, if you're right or not. Um, if you're wrong, I'm sorry. At least you tried, and I'm proud of you for that. So I'll give you a gold star. All right, great job. You know, thanks for trying. But uh, now we're going to actually discover if you were right or not so anywho um let's see here so for this first case if we're at low frequencies um cs at low freaks will have a high impedance why because it's 1 over Cs, right? And so this is, as this is very small, then the overall, oops, then the overall expression is going to be very large, right? So small S leads to large impedance. Okay. Um, so it becomes uh, comparable to... Uh, you know, roughly the 
one over the capacitance, right? So what does that mean in terms of our bandpass characteristic? Well, let's let's look at what happens when we when we crank up the frequency first. Then we can kind of compare, um, you know, apples to apples here. So as we turn up, we crank up S, right? Now what happens? Well, this becomes very very large, okay. And so the overall expression becomes very, very small. And so actually, this becomes effectively a short. And so there is no, uh, no capacitor there really at all for us. It just passes right through, which is what you've kind of always seen as we turn up this frequency. We have nothing more to worry about. All is good in the world. And this passes AC current, no problem. Um, so what's the, what's the, What's the upshot here? Well, this is actually what we would consider to be uh, a high pass characteristic, right? Because in a high pass, at the low frequencies, don't, oop, pretend like this is smooth, okay? Work with me here. It's going to bother me. I got to fix it. Okay. There we go. Okay, so down here at low, low S, i.e., low omega, right? Because we're using the omega J if you want to. You know, just stick with the, the kind of phaser stuff that we were doing before. No big deal. Um, it's it's not going to let much through at all. Um, but at these high frequencies, we get... Um, it's going to pass those frequencies, right? Well, right. Low. Or, sorry, whoops. I.E. High omega. Okay. So, yeah, there you go. It's basically a high-pass filter. And we talked about those a little bit last time. Um, so what happens in the parallel case? Well, the parallel case, as you might guess, uh, is just going to be the exact opposite of this. Why? Well, at low frequencies, this is kind of a pain in the butt, right? This is just a big old resistor in here, effectively. And so the current would probably, you know, pass through here. No big deal. But... More importantly, what happens when this is at high frequency? Well, it's going to let everything through. And what do you know? If I let everything through here, the voltage drop between here and here, uh, it ain't going to care about, you know, this resistor in the way here, right? So it's effectively going to drop to zero. So as this goes through, it's changes at very high or at high frequencies, high omega. Um, we're going to not pass any of our frequency behavior onto this V out. Okay. But at low Omega, we will. So it's the exact opposite of what we had before. Just common source amplifier circuit. For those of you that it's, uh, you know, been a little while. I know it's been a little while for me. Why do we call this a common source? Well, it's because they have the gate and the drain have this source in a common ground configuration. That's kind of a mouthful. Let me just put it simply this way. Uh, the easiest way to recognize this as common source is that the source goes to directly the ground. And our other two give us our other two um, parameters, right? Our V out is attached to our, uh, our, our drain here and our incoming voltage is attached to our gate. Noting here that for this assumption, for this model that we're going to use today, not for all future, but for right now, we have to figure some stuff out, okay? We're going to use our good old MOSFET small signal model that does not have the high frequency capacitors in there yet as part of that model. So these capacitors... Uh, you guys should know this already, right? But these things don't actually exist in there, right? There's not a directed current. There's not a tiny resistor in there. There's not a two tiny, tiny picofarad capacitors. We just use these as a model for some of the physical behaviors that we observe in these circuit elements. And so this MOSFET is a really complicated device. And so it exhibits a variety of features that only pop out at certain frequencies or under certain conditions. And so for right now, we're going to stick to our good old model that we have. And then we're going to, you know, next chapter, start to look at adding in those other features here and here after 
we've dealt with these other problems that we know are going to be an issue for us, i.e. we have to deal with this capacitor, this capacitor, and this capacitor first before we can even start to worry about what's really going on inside of here at those super high frequencies. So, yeah, that's, that's what we're doing today. Um, so, with that in mind, we rebuild... This is effectively a first step in, in trying to encompass all the frequency knowledge that we know. And then the next step, next chapter will be to add in these other capacitive elements later on, okay? That we know that the effectively are, are acting in that way. Okay, that's enough rambling on that. Let's get down to business. So what's the first step here? Well, actually, there's really nothing too strange or jarring about this. All we really have to do is just pop the capacitors in there. Uh, we're going to stick these two guys in parallel and just label them as such because we, we know how parallel resistors work. Why do we need to draw both of them? So to heck with that. Um, and then everything else is the same, as a matter of fact. So if I'm looking at my diagram here, I'm just going to walk through everything with you guys, just, just so you have a good sense of it. Um, let's start with C1. Okay, so at C1, I'm coming off of that RS, my signal, uh, the signal is going through my resistor, and then it runs into that capacitor. Okay, signal is coming into the resistor, and then it runs into the capacitor. Great. And then it runs into my, my ground, and it actually splits off to do its other funky thing. Uh, it's hitting the ground, the AC ground, through R1 and R2 in parallel. We've talked about this in the past and why these two guys live in parallel with one another, even though these are two different things. But effectively, they're the same grounding point because from an AC perspective, these guys don't have nothing going on, okay? They're just... <clears throat> All right? That's the scientific term for it. The... <clears throat> <laughs> All right, I had way too much coffee today, you guys. <laughs> it's going to be a fun lecture. All right, so here we go. We got the C2 capacitor, right? Where's that living? Well, if I look here, I actually have my, and I could really draw these little nodes out here. That'd be much nicer. Uh, I have my V out, right, with respect to my ground, however you want to draw it. Either one is just fine. Um, both are better, <laughs> realistically, right? Um, so effectively, what's going on here is uh, if I draw this out, correctly, uh, it's got to pass through, let me use this, it's got to pass through the C2 before it goes through RD, right? So it goes through C2 before it goes through RD. And then on the other end of it, um, coming out of the uh, V out, it's got to go through RL before it gets to that, uh, that other version of ground. So these are going to two different places, but they're effectively the same for the same reasons that we described. These two are both just ground. So we're good. Okay. Next, we have our third capacitor, which lives right meow. And what is this doing? Well, it's just in parallel with that RSS resistor. Um, not to be confused with the, I don't know, we just we said it was like a Nazi destroyer that Indiana Jones is going to blow up. Okay, so we have the RSS resistor in here in parallel with our uh, C3. You can see that behavior right here. And it's just coming right off of that source. So no big deal. Here's my source running through, and then it taps into ground. And that's pretty much it. Notice here I don't include RL in this funky thing because this isn't a ground source. And even if I wanted to, what maybe I could find a ground through there. No, no, no. Um, it's actually just, just those two in parallel, so it's pretty straightforward, you guys. Don't overthink it. Okay. Now, why is this important? What happened before that suddenly this graphic looks a lot different, especially right there? What the heck is going on? I can buy these two, right? Those, those kind of make sense. I just chucked them in there. This looks a lot different, and, and fundamentally, it is. What is this doing? This is actually taking... What we assumed to be a short here, a short path to ground, and it's actually making it uh, have to go through some paces a little bit here. 
So we actually have to think about what's happening in the relationship between this resistor and C3 in order to find out how we're dealing with that uh, voltage coming out of the source. So this is a this is you know this is a big deal. Um, and as a matter of fact, when we get to how we calculate uh, the resistance for that um, from the perspective of the third capacitor, it's probably the most uh, complicated part of our calculation. Okay, we know what a what a um, frequency response looks like, right? It has these certain parameters attached to it. And let me go back to it so you can see what's going on. We have a lower end and an upper end here, okay? And then we have some stuff happening in the middle. What we really care about today is what's going on on this lower half, okay? Where is the knee of that curve? Why do we care about that? Because that knee of the curve designates when we switch between, uh, between the realm in which capacitors are behaving at what we usually assume to be, you know, their AC behavior and their kind of semi-quasi non-AC behavior, right? Where they start to, to start to peter off and start to behave more like they do under DC conditions. Um, so why do we care about this side versus this side? Well, to be honest, um, we got to work our way up from basically zero, up through the mid-frequency range. We'll talk more about high-frequency behaviors later because, and this should come as no surprise, we haven't incorporated this stuff yet, okay? So we need to figure out what happens with the, uh, I know this is looking like John Madden over here at this point. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, but we need to incorporate our mid-frequency behavior first before we can really hunker down and figure out all the high-frequency model aspects that we need. Okay, everyone understanding where we're going and why we're just looking at omega L and not looking at omega H yet. If you don't, there's Piazza. Go there. Ask away. I'll say the same thing I just said. So we're going to find omega L. First step, we need to compute the RC time constant associated with each external capacitor. I don't know about you, but the first time I read that, that was kind of weird because I'm like, huh, that's cool, RC time constant. Yep, we haven't done that at all in this course yet, or maybe ever, who knows? So, so let's deal with that, shall we? Um, we're going to go over how to derive that. Don't worry about it. Mostly what it is, is it's coming up with this resistance. And that's the critical, um, the, the, the key part of this whole thing is calculating that resistance. Okay. And then once we have that time constant, we're going to compute the corner frequency associated with each external capacitor. Corner frequency, what does that mean? Well, that's just pretend like this goes off and then eventually it's going to come down, right? But we don't care about this region. We're not dealing with that today. We're just dealing with this stuff over here, right? Just this. So we're looking at this knee and we're trying to figure out the corner frequency associated with each, and I can't underline this enough, each external capacitor. So if you were just to look at this from the perspective of each capacitor, each one of these capacitors has their own knee of the curve, right? We talked about this um, in the last couple chapters where we looked at you know, these sort of toy models. And we said, okay, you know, you can do stuff to these toy models, whatever. Well, when we combine all these different toy models together, what we end up with is that the overall, the overall knee of that curve is determined by the maximum of all these guys put together. Okay. Because effectively, if one of them, right, isn't, isn't feeding through then ain't none of them feeding through, okay? So we have to go, well, that wasn't even the furthest forward. Let me go, let me outline the furthest forward one, okay? Uh, so let's say all of these existed here, and let's say, you know, as it will be, uh, this capacitor, as it turns out, it will be C3, uh, is the furthest forward, right, in the line of frequency behaviors that we may have. Well, then really nothing gets quote unquote turned on, uh, or it's not passing that frequency, uh, until I get through this because I have to make sure every one of these is turned on, or like I said, ain't none of them turned on. Okay. 
So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at all three of them and then determine which one is in fact turned on. As it turns out, this is going to be different a little bit uh, between obviously common source, common drain, and common gate amplifiers. And we also have the problem that uh, for the uh, for common drain, so note, uh, we have typically no bypass, okay, capacitor. What does that mean? This little capacitor right here for the common drain where the drain lives down here and we, everything's like topsy-turvy world, um, this don't exist in that model. So we only have this one and this one for the common drain amplifier. Now, oh, why did I erase that? I want to keep that. Okay, so that's one thing we're going to have to keep in mind. Uh, the other one is that, you know, obviously the equations are going to change a little bit too on us. And so we have to be careful of what the actual maximum value is, given the fact that the configuration of those uh, resistances and capacitances are going to be different between our different uh, amplifiers. Okay, so that explains, well, it didn't really explain the steps. So why do we do these steps? Well, essentially what we're trying to do is find an omega L, right? And in order to find the omega L, we have to find all the different omegas. And in order to find all the different omegas, we have to find all the different time constants. By the way, it's pretty straightforward. This is just how this is. Why is this true? What is a frequency? A frequency is something occurring over time. Something occurring over time is a frequency. So, yep, that makes sense. All right, so we find a time constant or something that's associated with time. Um, in particular, the, the knee of that curve from a time perspective. And then we're going to move forward. All right. So, I'm going to do this in... Uh, three steps. It's a three-step program. Um, in the first step, I have to break it out into all these different time constants, right? I have TC1. Whoops. I have the TC1 here. This guy. And then we're going to do TC2. Yeah. And TC3. Okay. And you can see all of these uh, different things highlighted as we go through, right? We're changing our location. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the Thevenin equivalent resistances seen by each capacitor via VXN and IXN. And we're going to replace N here with 1, 2, and 3. Yeah? Oops. N equal 1, 2, 3, okay? So, in order to do the Thevenin equivalent to find this resistance. What we need to do is short circuit all the other capacitors. We need to remove the AC voltage source, and then this will give us our resistance values as we plug in those placeholder, in particular this uh, VX1 potential here, and we can just calculate it from there. Well, this is actually pretty straightforward for this guy. It's just gonna be these two things in, in uh, parallel with each other, right? I'm sorry, adding, we're just gonna add those two things together, excuse me. Not in parallel. They're <laughs> they're in series, so we'll do that. So effectively, RC one is just going to be the sum of these two. Okay, these two guys here. And so, in order to calculate the time constant, well, the time constant is just the resistance value of C one times the capacitance of C one. So this is actually very simple. This is just RS plus R1 in parallel with R2, C1. All right. Bada bing, bada boom. Pretty easy. Um, as a general rule, we would expect, we expect generally uh, that R1 in parallel with R2 is going to be much, much greater than RS, Okay. So we sometimes will approximate this as uh, R1 in parallel with R2, C1, okay? Because this other resistance isn't really significant enough to matter to us too much. Okay. So what would this mean 
for our typical size uh, for our capacitor? Well, um, the book doesn't really get into it too much for the details. Um, and it comes down to, you know, some of the values that we've seen in the past for this kind of problem. But for R1 in parallel with R2, uh, typically we've seen stuff on the order of, you know, 10 to the fifth. Uh, so our total order for the time constant would be on the order of 10 to the fifth times whatever the capacitance is. All right, so we're going to keep that in our back pocket. And this isn't something you guys are going to have to typically derive Okay, I'm kind of just giving this to you as a, hey, this is what it normally is, okay? So don't worry about necessarily um, how this came in to be. Alrighty, next one is the TC2 uh, time constant, okay? This one uh, also is pretty straightforward. Uh, we're actually going to utilize the uh, current on this equation here. So here what we're going to do is remove C2 and replace it with that voltage source Vx2. That's what we do for the Thevenin equivalent. Um, so we're going to be injecting that current of Ix2 uh, out of its positive node, which you see right here. Okay, Actually, I should be using pink for that because I've been using pink for current all along. Don't ask me why. That's just what it is. Okay, so once we do that, uh, recall that all the other capacitors are short circuits for this analysis. So C3 is a short circuit and removes RSS from our analysis. So this is a short circuit here. So I don't care about this guy anymore because I can pass all my current through here. Okay, perfect. No good. We don't care about that. Um, and then these are still in our current model. These are disconnected, right? So I don't have to worry about any stuff leaking over here yet. Um, so I'm just going to pass through GMVGS, right? And then where else can my current go? Well, it's got to complete the circuit, right? It's got to go back through RL. The other way to look at this is you can look at the current going through. Yeah, okay, that's what the book says. The, book's, the book also agrees with me. This is just the current going back up through here. Perfect. Um, so by our normal convention, we have the following equation. So let me write this out. Use the current from and actually I'm sorry I forgot to draw in case you were confused let me let me go ahead and draw this out nicely so you have a good thing in your notes so my current is going through from here down through here okay and from here down through here and then it's coming back up it's got to equal the current going back up through here all right so effectively what I have is um, current from Ix2, right? And this is equal to minus IRL, which is equal to GM VG. Oops, make that a little bit bigger. VGS um, plus IRD, okay? Make sense? It should, okay. All right, so first we want to address the value of VGS. So here in the absence of, oh, I forgot to mention guys, I'm sorry, um, but we actually ditched this RO, the little RO. I'm so sorry. I know you're all very sad that we, we don't care about RO in this situation, but um, for, for the kind of, you know, ranges we're looking at and for the magnitudes we're looking at for different things, um, it really doesn't matter too much. So we're going to leave it off for right now. Okay. So anyways, um, so we don't have any RO. Uh, so it, uh, there is no necessity that, you know, this be non-zero. Uh, so specifically, we have no driving source on the left side to force anything other than VG equals zero. So really... Eh, so really, we can kind of say that VGS is, you know, equal to VG minus VS equals zero because we got rid of this, right? There's no driving force. So if there's no driving force over there, then we really don't have any potential through here, right? There's no potential. And with no potential comes no power <laughs> and no responsibility. So 
We have no responsibility to deal with this thing, okay? So all we're going to do now is we're just going to say, you know what? You know what? RC2 is just equal to RD plus RL. What do you think about that? You guys like that? I thought you might. Okay. Easy, easy, easy. Um, so all the injected current flows through uh, in series through RD, because this is now out. Let me put a big red X through that. There's nothing through here, right? And there definitely wasn't anything through here because of... Uh, whoops. Because C2, okay, this is zero. There. Man, I really need to lay off the coffee or I'm going to have a heart attack, I think. All right. Um, so we have this here. That's the only way I can stay awake anymore. I've, I've been doing too many lectures, and now I'm just losing my mind. So if you ever get a chance to teach online, um, don't. It's a huge, huge pain in the ass. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I've taught, I've taught in-person classes like, I've taught like four years probably of in-person classes for lower level math classes. And let me tell you something, this is way harder to do without people in front of you. And, and then you have to go through all the, the video editing and uploads and, and you're asynchronous from every, what everyone else is actually learning. And as an instructor, being there in person in real time really matters. So yeah. Anyways, um, that's my rant about our online classes right now. I, we don't really have much of a choice, but, you know, eh, hopefully. Um, yeah, so let's keep going. Okay, so RC2 is equal to RD plus RL. And so really this just boils down to our tau C2 is equal to... And I'm really sorry, guys. I've, I've written the letter tau, like literally thousands of times and I will never ever be consistent. I'm so sorry. Uh, this is equal to RC2 times C2, which is RD plus RL C2. And that's it. Note that RD and RL will typically both be on the order of kiloohms. So we ultimately have something like, you know, on the order of uh, 10 to the third C2, okay? That's about it. Now for the last one, the problem child, like me. Um, what do we have here? So this is the most complicated case, and uh, we want to probe the equivalent resistances seen by C3. So we short circuit C2, okay? And we short circuit C1. And we remove this guy uh, from here. So we allowed Vs to go to zero. All right. Now what? I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. Now you may say, okay, we got rid of this. Super. That means Vgs is equal to zero. This goes to zero. And, oh, uh, wait a minute. Hang on. Let's slow down for a second. I actually do have a voltage source right here. So... Hang on, we're making some potential over here. Let me let me figure this out. <laughs> However, what's happening at VG? So we really need to analyze this by, you know, the not necessarily as a as a total thing as VGS, but as VG and VS respectively, and see what the difference in potential really is. So, in looking at VGS, consider. VG. Well, VG is clearly just equal to zero, right? Because there's nothing pushing on G over here. This is all just kind of <clears throat> for a circuit. So no worries on that. Um, but I still do have a VS. And why do I have a VS? Well, I'm applying a, a current, or I'm sorry, a, a voltage over here. And so actually, yeah, I do have some VS uh, going on over here. So effectively, my VS just becomes, uh, it's equal to VX3, right? Because of this difference in potential here. So if I look here, this G, you could almost collapse this entire thing down, right? Because there's no, around this whole circuit here, there's no, there's no differences in potential. It's, it's effectively dead. He's dead, Jim. You, you can see it really easily. Here's my S. 
and then I have the RSS resistor over here. So here we have, you know, something pushing on it from over here. And so now I actually do have some difference in potential here. This is VX3, and this is S, and this is what is effectively the same voltage that I had at G, right? So what's really going on here is that my, my difference in potential must, in fact, be equal to uh, this. Because this is equal to zero, identically. Uh, and then, you know, this is whatever this guy is. So this makes a lot of sense. Okay, I'm going to leave the equals zero thing here. All right, so with that in mind, I actually do have a VGS. And so this, whoops, this guy here will also have a role to play uh, in this circuit. So that's a big deal. Um, so now what do I do? Well, I know if I look from a current perspective, right, IX3, this is the current that's coming out of the, um, the positive node, right? It's coming out of this positive node right here. And so I know that IX is equal to VX3, which is my voltage potential, right, over the resistance that I have, RSS, okay? And so, as a matter of fact, this is just equal, oops, it's just equal to, I'm sorry, is equal to this part, excuse me, comma, minus uh, GMVGS, okay? So I have uh, effectively three parts here, right? I've got, if I'm looking at this node right here, I'm looking at the stuff through VGS, or I'm sorry, GMVGS through that directed current. I'm looking at uh, the stuff through the RSS resistor, and I'm looking at uh, the current on this side of things right here coming out of the the node here so the current coming out of that node must equal uh this current here minus whatever current is being contributed from up here does that make sense so this part here comes from that this part here comes from there it's coming down And then finally, this business here is this guy coming from that. Okay. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Now, if I want to simplify things a little bit here, uh, I can do so. I actually know that VGS is equal to... Oh, I'm sorry. I've, I've, I've made a... No, I haven't made an error. Um, I know that VGS... <clears throat> is equal to minus Vs, which is equal to minus Vx3, right? And so in that way, all I have to do is just replace the Vx3 in there, and I have a nice consistent equation. And I'm sorry, this should be Vx3 here. Uh, I don't see any other mistakes, so we're good. Um, and so I end up with the following. I end up with Vx3. This is a big V here. Rss plus... GM VX3. Okay, so we have, uh, we factor out the VX3 and we end up with 1 over RSS plus GM. All right. And you might guess where we go from here. That's right. Uh, we have an I is equal to a V and such and such and such and such. Yeah, it's, we're looking at the ratio between the voltage and the current to give us that what do you know, resistance. So we just take this ratio here and we end up with just um, the reciprocal value here, which in point of fact um, just becomes uh, VX3 over IX3, which is equal to RSS in parallel with one over GM. And then all we do is we multiply this by, and forgive me for doing this, I'm going to make some more space for myself here. And it's going to be very sloppy. But you'll live. Okay, this guy goes over here. And this one's going over here. Okay, so now when I calculate this uh, time constant, uh, C3 is equal to R. By the way, this is equal to R 
C3. So this is RC3 times uh, C3, which is just equal to RSS in parallel with 1 over GM C3. Okay? Pretty straightforward. In general, we expect GM uh, is on the order of 500 to 1,000 ohms. So, and RSS is on the order of kilo ohms. So we expect the parallel combination to give us TC3 is on the order of uh, 10 squared C to the third, or uh, I'm sorry, C3. So all other things being equal so far, this is our smallest time constant, which means that this is going to give us our biggest omega, okay? And we're going to give these guys slightly different names as we move forward too, okay? And it's based on where they sit within the circuit. So we're going to call this first one uh, CVS. Uh, the second one is the C load. That one makes just a ton of sense. And then the C bypass also just makes a ton of sense. Why? Well, when we look back here, um, we're going backwards. Actually, let's go forwards. Okay, so this one's called VS because it's attached to our source, right? This is our uh, capacitor attached to the source. The second one is attached to our load. So we're going to call it our, um, our C at load. And this third one is attached to our uh, bypass, right? or it is our bypass effectively, right? Um, so when I look back at the full, uh, full circuit here, um, how are these acting? Well, this is acting as part of the signal, right? Going through here. Uh, this one's acting uh, part, as part of the load. And then this one down here is the bypass uh, down here, okay? So that's where we get these names from. Okay, so in conclusion, yeah, in conclusion, we have these equations which we derived. Um, what we're going to do from here is just say which one's the biggest. And as we noted before, this guy had the smallest value for tau. Whoopsies. Oh no, tapping all the wrong buttons. Oh no, someone help me. Okay, so that one had the smallest value for tau. means this has got to be biggest. All C's being equal. Ah. Oh my god. Come on. There we go. Okay. A roughly equivalent to each other in, in size. Okay, we're not going to take the capacitor out of your car and, and chuck it in here, alright? Um, but... Yeah, so by and large, that's, that's the case. Now, what happens when I have this special um, common drain amplifier? Well, what we said before is the common drain amplifier typically doesn't have that bypass capacitor. So guess what? When we calculate our final, um, and note here, this is omega L now is just equal to C, oops, omega C bypass. So, by the way, you only need this one for the CS circuit. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Okay, this is all you need. We've done all the hard work for you. However, you should keep these on standby should something unfortunate happen to this bypass capacitor. Okay, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. All right, so there we go. Um, so, we don't have a bypass capacitor in the case of the common drain. Um, we need to derive the other... Two, I'm not going to do that explicitly here. You now have the tools to do this. I encourage you, as a homework problem, derive the CD and CG uh, time constants and associated um, omega L for each case. And now, the exciting conclusion, where I'm going to give you the answer, okay? <laughs> so if you don't want, I mean, it's pretty straightforward because it just mimics exactly what we just did. You have the small signal models 
for these other amplifiers already built for you. We already did the hard work. So all you got to do is throw some capacitors in there, do some Thevenin equivalents, you know, a little salt, a little pepper, you're good to go. All right. So what we're going to end up with is T, or I'm sorry, Tau CVS. So we're going to end up with just RS, in pe that's not a comma, or parenthesis, come on, pen, uh, plus R1 in parallel with R2. This should look dreadfully familiar because it's the exact same thing. And uh, for Tau C load, it's a surprise. You'll never guess. By the way, this is a subscript here. So just in case you were confused, it's not omega times that. It's um, it's a subscript. It's subscript upon subscript upon subscript. And no, I'm not just saying that a million times. That's actually what it is. Um, RSS in parallel with 1 over R... I'm sorry, 1 over uh, GM. Note here, this one is slightly different. Um, but not really. And this is going to be multiplied to the C load. Okay, and then when we look at the, um, using our previous estimates, what we end up having is that uh, the equivalent resistance associated with the AC source, op, uh, uh, source capacitor is going to be about, um, let me write it this way, this guy, Oh, it's, it's already inverted. We're good. Uh, this is on the order of 10 to the 5th, CVS. And then this is on the order of 10 to the 3rd, CVS, or C load. And so clearly, ding, ding, winner, 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 chicken dinner, uh, this is what we have, okay? Um, our, our, our load is going to determine... Omega L in this case, okay? So notice here that the bypass was used in this case, and let's do some America 4th of July colors in here. It's only three days after the 4th, so I'm okay with that. Um, yeah. And then uh, we're good to go. Okay. So then for the common gate amplifier, and again, this one is a homework assignment for y'all, but we just end up with the following equations. Okay, pretty straightforward. Um, looks similar to what we have previously right here, but not quite anything like it. It actually looks a lot like this guy, right? And that's because the configuration um, is is very similar to that, except it's grabbing up this uh, RS as well, along with that parallel of RSS and, and 1 over GM. So just be careful when you're doing the derivations, and this will all come out in the wash. Okay, and then we have uh, TC load, is equal to 1 over omega uh, C load, which is equal to RD in parallel with RL. Um, another careful note here is that these are all in reciprocal form with respect to the next two pages. Okay, so if you need, if you need the time, whoops, if you need the time constant, just Okay, pen. Take the reciprocal of these, all right? Um, and of these. Um, okay, so we have these in parallel with uh, C load. And then tau of uh, the C bypass is equal to omega C uh, bypass, which is just equal to R1 in parallel with R2, C bypass. Okay. That should do it. Um, based on our approximations, uh, TC bypass will be really big. Um, so the capacitor will unlikely dominate the frequency response. So this guy's going to be out because it's way too large uh, as we take the reciprocal of it um, to get the omega value. The omega is going to be very small, conversely. Okay, so then uh, what we're going to end up with is um, TCVS uh, is going to... 
be pretty small. And so we expect that this is going to be the driver for us. So then we end up with omega uh, CVS is actually going to probably be equal to our omega L based on the order of things uh, that we end up with. Okay, so we have CVS, C load, and what do you know, C bypass. So funny enough, um, when you have these different situations, they all create three different types of solutions. These three different amplifiers have unique uh, solutions to them based off of which um, what those, those three same capacitors are doing within the circuit. So, um, yeah, they're all in there. It just, it matters what kind of amplifier configuration you have, which one's really going to be the driving force for that, um, lower kneecap of our end of the day curve that we're looking for in the frequency domain. And again, uh, what we've basically found is the Omega L for all three circumstances for, um, common source, common drain, and common gate, okay? And they're all different based on, on different capacitors, okay? They all have a unique capacitor within there that defines them of the three basic same capacitors, okay? All right, guys, that's going to do it for today. Um, please, if you have any questions or anything, uh, email me or whatever. And uh, next lecture is also going to be another one of these circuit analysis, applying all this stuff and doing all these things all at the same time, but we're going to be... Um, looking at the high frequency stuff. So